Uh, I'm pleased now to welcome to the platform John Mell, who's the European sales lead for IBM's social software collaboration platform. Prior to joining IBM, he ran the consulting team at Headshift, part of the Dacius Group. Uh, his current role involves helping IBM customers to understand how social collaboration software can help them uh, achieve transformational results. So, we look forward to John's presentation. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hope this lapel mic works, right? You can hear me? Um, so, thank you very much. So, as I said, my name is John. I look after IBM's social, um, social software business. Um, I'm also on Twitter, um, so I'm more than happy for people to follow me. We've had some debate in the office around whether we should have separate personal and work accounts. Um, I've gone for all in one, so as long as you're happy with talking about how to use sales and wikis and also my conversations with depressed Darth Vader, um, you feel, free to, feel free to follow me. And um, if I don't get the chance to speak to you today, I'm always happy to uh, talk about uh, any, any of this stuff on, on Twitter as well. Um, to come back to the Mac point, I also do use a Mac. On my first day at IBM, um, they gave me what could only be described as a brick. Um, and I went back to the Apple store on my way home um, to pick up a Mac. And if you think about the history of IBM and Apple, outside of Apple, we are the largest corporate deployment of Macs um, in the world within IBM. Uh, so we have a bring your own device policy um, uh, that we have, as, we have as well, but we see that shift happening uh, quite a lot too. Um, so I, I'm talking about um, social uh, software today and social collaboration. Um, and quite often when people start talking about social, um, they immediately start to think about Facebook. Um, and this is something because Facebook is really big and it's impressive and you can have a page and you can get lots of likes. Um, and it's growing really fast. It's growing so fast to cross numbers out and put new numbers at the top because it's really big and a really big thing. And so this is the way we should be, we should be working. And it's also all about young people. Uh, young people are using Facebook. They're used to working in this way. And unless you provide them with new types of tools rather than just email and, and, and Word documents, uh, they're not going to work for you. It comes back to the mortgage point. I'd like to see what happens when these people get mortgages and if they still have that, that, that same uh, mentality. But that is the point that, get, that often gets made. And it's also about engagement. Um, you have to keep your employees happy. And the way to keep employees happy is to give them social software with lots of young people around using social software. Uh, and that's how, that's how you, the, the value of social. Um, and also, it requires a large number of people. It's a great way to reach large numbers of people. And social really only works when you have masses and masses and masses of people. Uh, coming together and, 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 and you know, coalescing around these kinds of, uh, these kinds of things. Um, but then often when, you know, and, and that was kind of the message and the story, but it's about Facebook, it's about young people, it's about big crowds. Um, and, then, uh, and then you run into this guy um, when I go talking about social, and, and he really doesn't care about any of that <laughs> at all. Um, if you go back, if you think about these numbers of people, I often get quite... Um, uh, vocal about, is it, is it really the same thing getting up at, at 5 o'clock in the morning and protesting down the streets of London? Is that the same thing as clicking like on a campaign in Facebook? I don't think it is. I think it's far too easy to do that. Um, and it doesn't really send the same message in terms of what people are, are doing. Um, so it's, it can be sometimes you get a, a sort of a false vocal majority uh, who are a vocal minority who are able to, to make a huge impact just because they uh, get a huge number of likes on Facebook. But does that mean they're going to buy from you? OK, okay I've got lots of likes on Facebook, um, Mr. Customer, but it's not actually translating into any value. So we focus really a lot on, on, on business outcomes. Um, and the way to get people's like this attention sometimes is, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with um, uh, JetBlue and Southwest Airlines. They're kind of like the Ryanair and uh, EasyJet in the US. And someone was complaining to JetBlue because his plane was delayed. And then Southwest Airlines jumped in and said, well, if you, if you can get to gate 18 in the next 30 minutes, we'll get you a seat on our plane. OK, so the competition was actually watching and monitoring uh, what the other airline was doing. And the other airline didn't even know it had happened. Okay, didn't even know it had happened. That will get his attention, not how many likes you get on Facebook. Because when he thinks about social, uh, he thinks you mean this. Okay, and he doesn't want you doing that with customers or employees, or unless you're in sales, maybe, I don't know. But he doesn't want you doing that. Because that's, that's his perception of social. And um, taking a risk of maybe disagreeing with a, with a previous speaker. Uh, but social networks have been around since the dawn of time. 
right? not necessarily online, but social networks have been there since day one. Go back to the campfire that we were talking about earlier. And I kind of guarantee you, I wasn't there, but the very first economic transaction made in human history when someone swapped some sheep for some goats or something, I bet you those two people knew each other. They wouldn't have been strangers. And you look at very conservative industries like you know, law and financial services who kind of you know, say this is social networking is the kids and it's not necessary for us. But you go back, the whole history of those kind of industries has always been around uh, relationships and people who know each other and building social networks. It's how business has always been done. But as the previous speaker said, taking distance out of the equation completely changes how much that actually can help us completely changes it. It opens the world up to a whole new way of working. In the same way that sort of the original web opened up a huge uh, uh, facility for us to access data, the sort of second wave of the web, or Web 2.0 as it's been described, does the same thing for people. It opens this new relationship for us to uh, so able to access people and build relationships. And crucially what happens, especially if you look at the kind of a smaller um, end, of the, end of the market, um, when everyone's trying to grow, and you know, a small amount of growth, if you add, you know, if you add one person to a four-person company, it's 20% growth. It's like really, really big. Um, you have, um, as, you, as, you, as you go through that growth, you create complexity. You start to need to have systems. You start to need to have processes. You start to, the more people you add, the more complex it gets. And what we're saying with social software is, can we actually look at the way these things work? Not necessarily saying, let's do Facebook or let's do Twitter, but look at the way people interact rather than just systems and say, can we create something where it actually gets easier um, the more people use it? If you think about how a Facebook or Flickr or Twitter works, actually the more people that use it, the easier it becomes to work. And yet in working environment, when working with customers and partners and employees, the more we, the more we add to it, the more difficult it becomes. So what can we do to, 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 to alleviate that? And part of the problem is, um, you know, we spoke about email, is that you know, email is a really, really bad way of working. Okay, it's the old metaphor of taking a memo and sending it around the office and giving it to someone to actually send around the office and, 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 and as, a, as an office memo, we just create an electronic version of that. Okay, and it creates some really, really bad behavior. Okay, this is the email you get when it says, here's everything you need to know for the meeting on Monday morning. And they send it Friday night. Right? So you've got the whole weekend to read it and get up to speed and be ready on Monday, Monday morning. And it really doesn't help anybody. Um, and if you look at these kind of new ways of working, if you look at the, the, the scenario on the, on the left-hand side there, which is sort of four people reviewing a document. Now, that might be a sales proposal that you send to a customer. It might be a partnership agreement with a partner. It might be just some internal document that you're working with someone internally. Just the process of sending that round to review for four people is intense. There's 26 arrows there. Whereas compared to working in a more sort of Facebook way on the, on, the, on, the other, on the right hand side, would you really in Facebook, would you want to share a photo? Would you really dig out the names of all your friends, send them the photo, get all of them to email all the comments back to you and then copy and paste them and put them on a page? Of course you wouldn't. That's a crazy way of working. But it's the way we seem to work uh, in business compared to the way we work, uh, work in our personal lives. And just to show a, a, a quick story from, from my personal use of Twitter, where it just saved me a huge amount of time, was before I worked for IBM, they wanted me to go and talk at some of these events, these events like these, as a partner. And uh, they wanted to check my slides before I went and presented. Um, and so I had to go to the, uh, the, the office, the IBM office over at Heathrow Airport, which is in Bedfont. And so I put on Twitter, I'm going on my way to IBM Bedfont, if I'm free for a coffee. Now, the reason I did that is not because I want everyone to know that I like coffee. The reason I did it is because if I'm going to get dragged to that office, I want to make the most use of my time there. And the best way to make sure people know I'm there and the easiest way for me is to actually just type up my phone on the train and press, um, press go and it's there. Uh, rather than go through all the people who I might know, send them an email and say, hey, would you like some coffee? But then something really interesting happens. Because it wasn't locked in email and it was public, um, the guy who I was meant to meet um, gave me a call. And he said, hey, I see you're going to the wrong office. Right? You said you're going to the, the Heathrow office. We're actually meeting in central London. And so I was able to turn the taxi around, get the train back from Staines up into central London, and I was 10 minutes late for a three-hour meeting. Right? If I'd actually gone to that office and by the time I'd have realized that I was in the wrong place, it would have been over. I'd have had to reschedule the meeting. 
So it's really important that I'm not doing this for altruistic reasons. I'm not sharing, I'm not being social because I'm nice. Right? I'm actually sharing and I'm being social because I'm quite lazy. And this is the easiest way for me to get the information, the information out to people. So this is really important when you think about trying to collaborate. You're not trying to get people to do things for free. It's actually a value for them to doing it. And also, it's really important to see that, and poor Hugh hates it when I show this slide, he only has about 14 followers on Twitter. Okay, so it goes back to that point. You don't need massive amounts of network. You don't need hundreds of thousands of people. It's not just the IBMers in the world um, who, can, who can take advantage of this way of working. Okay, that, remember that diagram at the start with just four people um, reviewing one document? It makes it a huge, hugely easier working, working in this way. And just to show some examples of how I use socially, how I work socially within IBM, um, and then also some ways that some of our customers are working as well. Um, so this is a, a kind of email that I will get, um, which uh, scares me half to death from a vice president, and it says, you know, John Mel will coordinate. Okay, and there's about six or seven people in this, in this email thread. So I know that's going to be, um, you know, reply all, reply all, reply all, reply all, 50 to 100 emails that I will get, and I'll have to spend the weekend going through it. And again, not huge numbers of people, six, seven people, but they're really, you know, they're really important. They've got a lot of stuff in their heads. They will have opinions, and they will be telling me these opinions, and I'm going to have to synthesize it all. Okay, and then, of course, they'll forget halfway through that they're meant to include Joe, and I'll say, John, please bring Joe up to speed with all the discussions. And I'll send Joe this email that says, hi, Joe, start up a Bossman, read up. Okay? And then you'll be fully up to speed. And then Joe will hate me because Joe will have to spend his Saturdays working. So instead, before anyone can send me a reply, I create a, a page on our internet that anyone can edit. Anyone can edit. And I cut and paste, and I put the, uh, the questions in there, and I say to the people, knock yourselves out. You go in, and you can see there they start to add these comments. And I play golf on a Saturday and I don't have to work. So again, I'm being social and I'm working in a public way, but I'm doing it because I'm lazy and I'm selfish. It's not because I'm nice. I'm not a nice person. <laughs> and also we use this for planning. So in the same way that we're working with um, uh, partners uh, externally, we use this to plan internally as well. So if we're planning a, a training session, again, just small numbers of people, three or four people. This is how we planned our recent training session and we put everything in one single place on the web. Everything goes into the web in one place. All emails, instant messaging, uh, documents, drafts, discussions, they all go in here. And it's really useful when we're actually planning it because everyone knows where to look and everything's stored in one place. But what's even more useful is the following year, everything is there as a template for their people to reuse. We don't have to say, oh, who was it who organized it? Which email folder is that in? Where is it? And even in small groups of people, that makes a huge difference. And also what you see, you don't just see the final agenda. So it's not just here is the final agenda we did for our training. You get to see all the discussion as to why it was in that, the way it was. So maybe they really tried to get a certain speaker, um, but they couldn't, get, they couldn't manage to work the diaries, so they ended up with me speaking, and they were really disappointed. Okay, but then next year when they see that, they say, well, let's not settle for John. Let's go back to the original person that the team wanted in the first place, which you never get if you just end up with the end discussion. So you actually see why people came to the decisions they actually made, and everything's held uh, in a central place. So the way we, uh, we look at this with, with customers is we have this kind of framework that we work on um, in how you would want to work socially. And the first one is all really about alignment. So there was a company in the, in the US, not one of our customers, but a really interesting um, company. And they uh, make t-shirts. And what they did was they had a, run an online competition. And they opened it up and they said, anyone who, uh, who has a good idea for a t-shirt design can submit it. And we'll vote on it. We'll have a public vote. And the winner will get $15,000 and we'll make the t-shirt. So what they get is they get a pre-defined, uh, you know, that they know the t-shirt is popular because they've voted on it and they've got all these votes. So they know the t-shirt is popular. They know it's going to be a winner. They know it's going to be a hit. And they don't have to pay for any of the failed designs that weren't popular. They only have to pay for the winner. Okay. Neat idea. But what did their designer think? Okay. What did their chief designer think when, he, when suddenly you're going to outsource all this, um, all this great, uh, you know, this, this, this process, which is mine? Okay. There's a big cultural change in that company. Even a small company, 10, 15 people. Big cultural change. 
in how they did it. And what actually happened was he became, he became the curator and the coach and the person who helped the people who were submitting the designs make the designs the best they could possibly be. But his role changed. He wasn't the person who sat in the ivory tower and suddenly came up with the best design. So it's really important that you think if you're going to suddenly open the world up, if you're going to have individual conversations with customers, if you're going to reply on Twitter, if you're going to actually listen to what people are saying about you on Twitter and take it into account, you better make sure that your culture is ready to hear that because it might not be what you want to hear. It might not be what, the way you want to work. So that's very, very important. The other side of it is making sure that you gain trust. Um, this is something that, uh, that you know, the airline example did really well when they start to say, they start to actually reach out and have conversations um, in public about maybe things that have gone wrong. Uh, if people are having to do product recalls or people are, need to work in a very transparent way, actually engaging in a dialogue with your customers and admitting when you've made mistakes or things haven't gone so well really do create a huge amount of trust um, that will allow you to uh, you know, help you get over mistakes that you make. <coughs> Social gives a huge amount of ability to engage through uh, experiences. We, we heard about the numbers of how-to searches that have been searched on YouTube. There's a company called Blendtec. Has anyone heard of Blendtec and the blenders that they make? They're in the States, so it may not be a, a not everyone may know of them, but they, um, they were a run-of-the-mill kitchen blender company. And they suddenly had an idea of putting a video on YouTube um, called Will It Blend? And they started dropping in just things they found, you know, video cassettes, will it blend? DVDs, will it blend? And they had this guy who comes in in a white coat and he kind of drops it in and they make a big thing about it. And we just put it on YouTube. The production costs are tiny because it's just the guy in the suit and then um, they put it on YouTube. So all the distribution costs are taken care of and it's just a, a camera. But then they got in this thing where every Apple device got, that got released then became Will It Blend? So they blended an iPhone and they blended an iPad um, and they had the fake Steve Jobs come in and they just made it really entertaining and really funny. Just on the basis of that, their sales went up by 700%. 700%, seven-fold increase in sales, just because they're creating this experience and people were suddenly interested. And when a new Apple product came out, their fans were like, well, when are you going to do the video of blending this Apple product? So it makes a huge difference in terms of being able to work like that. And looking at your networking, looking at your business processes. So if you look at the, the, the T-shirt company, the thing they did, they didn't say, let's get lots of likes on Facebook. Uh, let's go and be on, let's be on Twitter because it's cool and we really want to do it. They looked at their business process, which was their research and development function, their design function. And they said, how can we improve this? How can we actually look at, a, uh, how can we actually look at this and, and make, it, make it better? And then we talk about design for risks. We, we heard about the, you know, every chief security officer's nightmare. What if things go wrong? Um, when you open yourselves up to this, is your culture going to be able to accept that you're kind of taking a risk having these conversations in public with customers, with partners, with employees? So it's important that you don't put your head in the sand and think too much about, I'm going to stop it from happening. I'm going to stop everything from going wrong. Of course, you should try and stop things from going wrong. But you need to be prepared for and accept that things will go wrong because we're dealing with people and have a plan as to what will you do to make sure, what will you do when it does happen? What will you do when so a customer does be vocal on Twitter and says they don't like you? What will you do if an employee does something stupid online or posts an inappropriate comment on a blog? And practice it. Practice what you're doing. And finally, don't, you, the, the data that you can get out of this is absolutely amazing. The more interactions that you get with customers, the more interactions that you get with your partners and your employees, the more data it creates. Um, and the ability to do analysis of what are people saying about you online, what are people saying about you on Twitter, what are people saying about you on blogs, is huge, huge competitive advantage that you can have. So a few examples. Um, this, uh, this is one of my favorite examples after the, the T-shirt company, uh, a guy called the English Cut, and he was uh, just a, a, a tailor uh, in the UK. And he started blogging not about his products and his expertise, but just about tailoring in general, about how to make suits, how, about different fabrics, fabrics he liked, he didn't like, different stitches he used, all these kind of things. You talk about that, you know, creating trust. He created a huge amount of trust in, because people felt that he had expertise and he knew what he was talking about and he wasn't trying to sell to them. And it hit him when he put on his blog that he was, he used to go to the States once a year. And, uh, and if he sold enough suits to cover the, the, the plane ticket for him, uh, two or three suits, that was enough for him. That validated the trip. 
he put in his blog that he was going to go to the States, and all of a sudden he had like 20, 30 inquiries saying, I want you to come and, and, and bring me a suit that I, will, that I will pay for. So he managed to punch above his weight by an amazing, uh, amazing factor just by showcasing his expertise and just by making sure that he was uh, known and respected in the industry um, rather than just saying, here's my online suit catalog, which would you like to buy? And we've taken lessons from that as well. So on our, our individual sales reps now have their own page on IBM.com that they can put up there what they want. We give them a template and a format that they can put up what they want about their, uh, about their expertise, their interests, how they work with customers. So you, you're trusting and empowering employees to do that and put it on there then creates a relationship of trust between the company and the individual because our customers aren't dealing with you know, big old IBM anymore. They're dealing with individual people uh, which is a much better way that people, people want to work. So it's really interesting how this guy, is able, this guy in particular was able to really create a, you know, expand his business immensely um, by showcasing his expertise. Um, just some other um, customers of ours who use our technology to do this kind of stuff. So um, uh, Bamboo Dessa is a, a, a chain franchise of Indian restaurants and they expanded very, very quickly from five restaurants to 40. And again, as they got more and more people and more and more chains and more and more franchises, it became more difficult to manage. And they were sending faxes and emails and documents to, across to each other. And so what happened on this is they started sharing experiences of best ways to greet customers as they come into the restaurant. Just something as simple as that. What's the best way? You know, how, how do we do this? What's the best practices from all the different restaurants and how can we learn? And then they started doing sharing menus um, and tips and tricks and all these kind of things just on a, on a secure online collaboration platform. Um, and it was open, kind of like the, the email and the response to the email I got. It wasn't locked away. It was open so everyone can see the discussions. And oh, we tried this last night and it didn't work. We tried this, it did work. Okay, small company able to do that. Russell's Convenience Stores, they, are, um, they uh, open stores in big office buildings. So in a big office building, they will open like a, a little grocery store for people to be able to shop as, as they work. And again, on a franchise model, um, they, were actually, they actually collaborated with architects in terms of the best way for them to fit into these, you know, their small store within a store effectively, the best way to fit into these big organizations. And the key to this is how we work, is when we, when we work with these customers, we only charge people for the employees who are using the system. So they can have as many guest accounts and they can invite as many external people to collaborate with them as they want, but they only pay you know, a couple of pounds per user per month for the actual individuals within the organization, which makes it really cost effective to go and reach out to and really expand your reach, kind of like the Taylor guy did, uh, to make sure that you are hitting the maximum number of people as possible. Um, Signature Mortgages Company, again, st they started sharing documents online with their customers um, rather than having to send through the mail and fax. And they reduced the amount of time it took to approve a mortgage um, from 10 days to 48 hours. And actually closing on the mortgage went down from 60 days to 30 days. So again, it wasn't to be fun. It was to work in a much more efficient way with their customers. And it had dramatic business results that actually made, gave them a competitive advantage. Newlyweds Foods, they're the people who create ready meals. Um, and what they did, uh, so they have customers like supermarkets who will, who will sell uh, ready meals. And they started kind of like uh, Bob Odessa by creating a space for their chefs to share recipes and tips and tricks on how to, the best way to create uh, these ready meals. What they ended up doing is then opening it up and said, hang on a second, why aren't we getting our retail customers to come in and tell us the reason why things are selling, aren't selling, um, because a report is one thing, but actually being able to interact with people makes a huge difference. And again, by being able to opening it up to the guests, it doesn't cost them anything to bring these people in and, and start to work on, work on these things. And AA Translations is a, is a, a very fast-growing translation uh, company, uh, uh, you know, English to Japanese and, and, and that kind of stuff. And again, rather they are sharing the drafts and the work in progress online in a secure environment, um, in a way that is far more efficient than simply uh, emailing documents backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards to people. And then my favourite um, example that I wanted to finish on um, is uh, an Australian zoo, and um, it's just uh, they just have uh, ten uh, ten users uh, of our of our system. But again, they've opened it up to all the zoos in Australia, and they're sharing best practices on how to get pandas to mate successfully. 
and they're driving that and they're really having a huge impact in, uh, in, in, in terms of wildlife uh, in Australia um, by sharing these, these best practices with these scientists from all the different, all the different zoos. So what they're doing is the, the key themes there are where there are just small numbers of people working on projects or small numbers of people working on ideas, being able to A, work together more effectively, but then B, being able to open it up and actually get external parties to come in and work with them as well, uh, working on the principles of working more in a Facebook way rather than in a traditional email and document way, but not necessarily saying we're going to have Facebook for, the, for, for businesses and we're going to start getting lots of likes because that's cool and that's what the kids want. And fundamentally, it's about making sure that we, make, so we stop creating these systems and processes where the more people we add, the more complicated and more difficult it gets and the more costly it gets, and to try and find a way where it actually gets better um, the, more people, the, more people use, the more people use our systems and more people that we work with, um, because that helps us all uh, be more successful. So, thank you very much.